Hey, nerdy knitters. Welcome to another episode of the Nerdy Knitting Podcast. Get your favorite beverage and your knitting and let's settle in for a good chat. Everything we discuss, you'll find linked down in the video description box. I don't really have any knitting news this week, but I do have a request for some advice. I've got a video idea percolating in my mind about advice and tips for knitting on a budget or knitting when you're broke, because right now I'm sure a lot of us are pinching our pennies, and I would love to know how you save money on your knitting, on your notions, your yarn, your patterns, any tips and advice that you have to share. I've done a video in the past with some advice, but I'm sure that you have more tips to share, and I'd love to collect them and make another sort of roundup video of all of those great little nuggets of wisdom from many different knitters. So if you have any stories about when you've scored big or anything that you'd like to share regarding that topic, then I'd love to hear about it. So please leave me a comment down below. And I thought I'd include in this sort of knitting news section, things that I've been reading. I read quite a lot every evening before I go to bed, even if it's just a chapter, mostly fiction. I really like good stories and they can be from all different genres. Right now, it is um, this book by Orson Scott Card called Wakers. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He wrote a series, well, the first one was called Ender's Game. It's been made into a movie. Oh, goodness, quite a few years ago now. Um, it's a sci-fi style, and this one is too. So if you like science fiction, I'm not sure still how I feel about this one. I really liked Ender's Game, and I thought he had read all of them, but I was checking my Goodreads list, and I didn't have them marked off. So I think I'm going to read them again anyway. So that's on my to-read list. I have a long list from the library, and I just finished this book by him. I'm not quite sure. If you've read it, I'd love your thoughts about it, but it felt a little too... Like he spent a lot of time in the what-if, like, jargon, like talking back and forth about what if we did this, what if we did that. I guess I should tell you what it's about first. It's Well, it's a sci-fi story. A teenage, I think he's 17-year-old boy, wakes up in sort of like this glass type coffin you can see on the cover and he learn he figures out he's a clone of somebody and the room is filled with other coffin like structures but all of the the clones are dead except for one other teenage girl that very introductory part reminded me of the movie uh i think it's called passengers with jennifer lawrence and chris pratt the rest of it is not at all but just that little bit so it's like this completely abandoned planet it's Earth, and he's in Greensboro, North Carolina, and um, but there's nobody there. It's completely deserted, except for him and this other girl who's still asleep. She hasn't been woken up yet, so it's about his experiences there trying to figure out what's going on, and there's other things in it. He can jump from one time stream, they call it, to another um, that he is a part of, and there's a lot. That's where all the technical jargon stuff, they spend a lot of time talking about the what ifs of that. And I felt like, oh, just get back to the story. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever felt that way about a book where they just, it feels like they're not getting to the point, to the plot, you know, like it felt like he wanted to talk about all of these what ifs and technical side of time jumping and all of these things when I just really wanted to have a good story. And the story was good if you it can skip past all of that technical stuff. So if you like sci-fi, you might want to give this one a try. Sort of give it maybe three stars because I liked the premise of it and I'm wondering if it's going to be, I mean the story wraps up, but I'm wondering if there's going to be more in the future in that series. But it did revive my interest in his books. I haven't read anything by him in a long time, so I'm going to reread the Ender's Game series. So that's what's on my reading list this week and I'd love to know what you're reading. I'm always looking for new book recommendations, so you can leave them down below as well. We have a few knitting questions to get to today, so let's get right to those. The first one is from last week. Masuga had a question about armpits and making those underarm area, making that more nice looking, more nicely finished, so it just looks really nice. And we discussed different ways to do that in the last episode, but somebody left a great comment. Cindy mentioned that she likes to do the provisional cast on for the few underarm stitches. This is something that she learned from a YouTuber called Franco. His name is Frank, I believe, but it's P-H-R-A-N-C-K-O. He recommends this in his sweater patterns, and he has a video showing it for the underarms, and it works very well. So I'm going to link to his video about that explains how he does the crochet provisional cast on and uses that to join, because after you 
put those stitches on waste yarn, whatever you're working on, and then you have to join to work in the round again, he uses a provisional cast on right there because then you can take out that cast on edge and you can graft the stitches you saved to that cast on. I didn't watch the whole video, but I figured that would be the idea of it. And that really does make a very seamless line. You don't get that edge where you have to pick up stitches along a, a cast on edge because you're using a provisional cast on. So you can unzip it and use the live stitches and graft them together. Now I'm not sure how it works. Like if you get, cause you do end up with like my, like holes to either side of that edge, but I'm not sure he probably has a way to deal with that as well. But if you really want a very seamless look, then this would be a great way to do it. Our next question is from Scripture for Women. Using natural fibers is not always affordable. It's just so expensive. Are there any synthetic yarns that are comparable in drape? An example would be a lace or DK weight shawl. Now it depends. We're gonna talk about synthetic, the process today and acrylic yarn. And it really depends on how it's processed. I mean, you've probably seen plenty of like novelty yarns. It can be the same sort of, it can be labeled as acrylic, but it looks nothing like, you know, a red heart super saver yarn, like just your standard acrylic. So it really, it depends on the, the way it's processed, first of all. Um, and every yarn is different. Like it's hard to, I don't have a recommendation for you for a particular yarn that has good drape, but what you could try is knitting on larger needles. That will generally give you more of a flowy fabric because it creates larger, looser stitches. Um, you're just going to have to try them out. If anybody has any recommendations for synthetic yarns that have good drape for a shawl, then please leave your comments below about that. I know that um, I've seen like sort of those shawl cakes like those. I've used a few of those and I thought they were just fine for like the skinny cakes and I can't remember what their names are. And I think as long as you choose a, a, an appropriate need needle size, then you can get fairly good drape with those. But don't knit on like the recommended needle size like or on the small side because you're going to get a tighter fabric and it won't have that flow and movement as well but i don't really have a great answer for you for that another thing you can do is actually check ravelry if you're looking at a particular yarn and you want to know how it's going to knit up then see what projects have been knit with it some people will um, include their needle size that they used and everything so you can get a good idea of what to look for that way as well. So I don't have much more advice beyond that. I haven't knit with a ton of acrylic yarns, so I don't really know which ones would be great for shawls, but maybe somebody else does. Leave a comment and we can share it next week. Our next question is also from Scripture for Women. Why use two strands of one yarn instead of just one that is the same diameter as two? Uh, first reason would be because that's what the designer chose. Unless you can crawl into the mind of the designer and ask them, it's hard to say why. They might say, like in their pattern, why they chose that. A lot of the times it could be because they want that, like the brushed mohair or alpaca. They pair that lace weight yarn with another yarn to get that brushed look. Sometimes you can pair, this is something we discussed a few weeks ago, and it is a good idea to pair a lace weight wool with something that's not elastic, like a cotton, like there, there's a, a plant fiber generally that doesn't have good bounce back for a garment. You could pair it with a lace weight wool to give it some elasticity. And of course your mileage may vary on that. So you'd have to try it out, but it really comes down to what the designer intended. Oh, or another way would be because they're using two different colors and they want to sort of make a marl color, combining those two colors. I'm sure there's other reasons. That's all I can think of, but you can swap it out. If those two yarn weights equal another yarn weight, then you can use that yarn weight instead. But of course, you're going to want to swatch to see how that fabric feels compared to what the designer had intended. And the next question is from Fawn. Beginner question, how does one figure out certain increases and decreases? How many are there? I know yarn over and KFB. I know there's some left leaning and right leaning, but not exactly how to do that or what they're called. Do you have tutorials? And what about the abbreviation SSK? What does it mean and what's it used for? Okay, so the basic increases are your yarn overs, your KFB, then you have a make one, which can be open, right, or left, and then your lifted increases, which can be right or left. And those can also be done purl-wise, like if you're doing them in reverse stockinette or you want to work them in a purl stitch specifically, then you can work them purl-wise as well. So there's lots of ways to work those increases. I have a I have videos about them, but I also have um, 
uh, page on my website that has all of the videos and all of the pictures and instructions. So I'm going to link to that so you can see the different ones. And you want the right and left because sometimes you want to mirror your increases. Like if you work right now, I'm working on sleeves for my daughter's cardigan. So I'm working a make one right at the beginning of the row. And to mirror that, which it slants off to the right, I want it to slant off in the other direction. I want it to slant off to the left so it doesn't look, doesn't both, they don't both run in the same direction. So I use a make one left. So, and the SSK is the pair for the knit two together. If you knit a knit two together, it leans off to the right. So you can work an SSK, which will lean off to the left. So it becomes the mirror image of the knit two together. So when you want to mirror your increases and your decreases, that is why you would do it. And that's how you would do that one. Um, but I do have a video about that too, or an, an article as well that talks about the decreases and pairing them. So I'll link to that as well. And one more question from Nana Kathleen, what shawl pattern would be best for beginner knitters? So I have a few recommendations for you. My first would be Grain by uh, Tin Can Knits. That's the first shawl I ever knit. It's a top down triangle shawl and they've got great tutorials on their website that have great pictures. So that walks you through really well how to work that shawl shape. If you want um, just a plain rectangle, the Elementary Wrap by Pearl Soho is a good choice. It's just stockinette stitch. And then there is Spindrift by Helen Stewart of Curious Handmade. That's a crescent shawl. It's a free pattern on her website. And it's written out very well. Like she uses like a, a sort of a chart format and it's very step-by-step -step and easy to follow. So those would be my top three recommendations depending on the shape that you want to knit. They're all very basic stockinette. Uh, I think Spindrift has like some eyelets. Um, you can do different stripes and color work. A grain is like very simple pattern, so you can really change it up with however you'd like to work the colors in that. That's just in garter stitch. So any of those three, if anybody else has any ideas for beginner shawls, then leave a comment down there for Nana Kathleen. Oh, and I do have a playlist with, um, cause I have a few different videos now about shawls for beginners based on their shape. So I'll put a playlist down below as well. We're gonna have a lot of links down there this week. So it's time to jump to our discussion and we have dis been discussing the different fibers. So as just a refresher, we have animal fibers, which come obviously from animals, uh, wool, alpaca, silk, um, mohair, angora, possum, camel, there's lots of different fibers. Um, goodness, you can even like comb the hair off your dog or your cat and probably and spin that and knit that if you wanted to. I've never attempted that. I've never thought about, well, I've thought about it, but I've never attempted it. If anybody's tried that, I would like to know. So let me know if you've ever like collected your pet's fur and spun it and knit with it. I love my dog, but I'm afraid that anything I knit with her with, with by like her fur would smell like wet dog <laughs> if it got wet, you know what I mean? So I'd rather skip that. But anyway, so back on topic. And then we have plant fibers, which like cotton and linen. And then within that category, we we'll also have biosynthetics, which are natural resources like uh, bamboo, but they need some type of synthetic process to turn them into yarn because you can't just break off a piece of bamboo and start knitting with it. It has to be broken down to become a fiber. So I still group it with the plant materials because the main source is plant, a plant source. Um, but really you can categorize them. You could fit that under synthetics if you wanted to because it needs a synthetic process. But now we are going straight to synthetics which use a, a synthetic process but also use synthetic matter. So they take a petroleum based matter and it's melted and it's blended and then it's extruded through spinnerets and that creates filament threads. These are then bundled together and then those threads are stretched and they're cut to imitate the staple length of other fibers before being combed and spun into yarn. It's a big process, but because it's just like this liquid matter that they put through these like process spinneret things, this is where you can get all of these different novelty yarns like the feathery things and all the ribbon things and so many different things they can do because they can make these different machine parts that will process this material in a different way. So you get all of those different novelty yarns in synthetic fibers. But then of course they can also be very um, natural fiber-like because they treat them like 
other fibers. They stretch and they cut them so they imitate like a wool fiber and they comb them and spin them into yarn. So um, it ends up looking and feeling like real natural fibers. So it has become more refined over the years, um, like say 40 years ago, the acrylics from 40 years ago compared to the acrylics today feel can feel very, very different. So this process is used for all synthetic fibers. We're gonna focus on acrylic today, but there's also like nylon and polyester. We'll talk about them next week. But the advantages of an acrylic yarn specifically would be that it's of course very inexpensive. You can, you can buy skeins and skeins of it for very, very little. And it's widely available. Go right to your big box store and you'll find plenty of acrylic yarns. A very wide range of colors because it's very easily, easily dyed. It's soft, it's lightweight, it's durable, it's water resistant, machine washable, very resilient, and it doesn't shrink. So it has lots of great advantages, but there are some disadvantages. I have here that it can't be blocked, but it sort of can, I guess. I don't have a lot of experience with blocking acrylics, so I'm not quite sure. A lot of people say like you could steam it and that kind of kills the fibers. I'm not sure if that's the correct term. We're gonna have to do some research about that, but um, washing and drying it sort of sets the fabric the way it's going to be, I suppose. But um, let's say you just knit a, a long piece of just stockinette stitch. There is no way to get that to uncurl. Like if it were in wool, you could block it out. It's eventually going to curl back up because of the nature of stockinette. But the fiber will let you block it. But acrylic is a different beast. Like you can wash it and dry it, but that's not going to make it lay flat. You know what I mean? But some people have told me they've had some um, success with wetting it and pinning it and with steaming it, but it's sort of try your own risk because it's basically a plastic material. You have to be very careful with the heat because you can literally melt it. So anyway, so I have the blocking is an issue with acrylic because it's not, not something you can easily block. So it does, it absorbs odors. It's not as breathable as natural fibers, can be prone to pilling. Again, that will depend on the manufacturing process. It's not as insulating as wool or other animal fibers. It can be scratchy, but hey, so can wool. And it is, of course, heat sensitive, like it will melt because it's a plastic, basically. So it's a good choice for hard wearing garments, for kids, um, anything that you want to be able to machine wash and dry. Like my, my daughter wants a new cardigan, but she is not gonna wanna like, block it or pin it out and let it hand like she's not going to hand wash that so I knew it had to go something that she could at least put in the washer and dryer even I do try to encourage her for hand knits to put them on at least the hand wash or the gentle cycle to treat them a little more gently even though it's going to just be an acrylic you know still be careful with it um, it's a great choice for gifts for especially if you know the person is not going to want to care for something like a wool garment or for charity knitting, a lot of uh, charity and donation places, they specifically ask for acrylic and they even want like the tags in it so it can, well, that has um, the care instructions because it's just easier for people to take care of. Now, where you're gonna run into issues is with, um, well, lace, first of all, like if you're knitting a lace shawl, because of the blocking thing, like if you're knitting in any other fibers, you can pin it out and stretch it aggressively and get it to take that shape. With acrylic, you might be able to. It's sort of like you have to swatch and test because it, the, just the nature of acrylic, it's not, doesn't act the same way. So, but you could try the gentle steaming, like don't press an iron to it, but hold it above it. Put like maybe a wet, a damp towel in between and steam it. That might work or use a handheld steamer, but again, don't press it right against the, uh, the yarn. Um, this is just one of those cases where it's sort of a test to see how it's going going to work. Um, so lace, because of the blocking, like if you're knitting a big lace shawl, that is something to try out how you would block that. Uh, another issue would be um, highly textured and cabled patterns because um, can, they can be a bit iffy in acrylic because like those kind of things I like to use animal fibers for because they've got especially wool because it has more elasticity and it has more give and it's just more forgiving. You like, I mean, if you've ever knit um, like a ribbing in cotton yarn, you can see, oh, it just looks like such a mess because there's not much give in that, 
in that yarn. But if you do it in wool, there's more give and more elasticity. So it ends up looking better, but you can get that issue with acrylic. But again, it depends on the manufacturing process and how that particular yarn has been developed. Like I'm using Knit Picks Brava right now for my daughter's cardigan and it looks great. The stitches look great. The ribbing looks really well, but I did take care with it because I wanted it to look nice. Um, but it's, it's sort of one of those iffy things, depends on the acrylic itself and how that particular yarn has been processed. Um, okay, you, we will want to avoid acrylic sometimes, especially for household items that are going to be near a heat source, like a pot holder or a trivet or anything like that, because they are heat sensitive. You could melt the fibers, so you don't want that plastic hot mess on your stove. So that's not a great choice. This is actually one of those things. I know a lot of people use cotton yarn and I did too. I have a cast iron pan and the handle gets hot. So I knit like a little cotton cozy for the handle. Not thinking about the fact that plant fibers will continue to burn. It's like a candle wick. They just burn and burn and burn. Wool on the other hand is self extinguishing. So anything that's going to be near a heat source. Now I try to knit it in some type of a wool yarn because it's less of a fire hazard, honestly. I've, <laughs> I have set too many potholders and dishcloths and things on fire accidentally. So <laughs> anything to save me from that. So um, for things like that, I do prefer wool and acrylic is one of those things you want to avoid because of the heat, it will melt. Oh, and it can even burn your skin. So this is where I get a bit iffy about like baby garments too, or anything like that. Um, I don't know, I would, I would be very nervous about not very nervous. I mean, my daughter's going to have an acrylic sweater, but for, for, for little ones, I don't know if there's that extra concern of the fibers can actually melt and burn on the skin. But in general, I use it as a substitute for most other yarns. I think it works well. But again, this really comes down to the manufacturing process because different acrylics are processed differently and they're meant to act differently. You get all those novelty fibers, but the general acrylics, I think they are meant to be as a replacement for those who don't want wool garments or even plant fiber garments. Um, so it's something that it's one of those issues where I'm just going to say swatch and see if it's going to work for the pattern that you've selected. But in the most cases, like if I'm like I'm knitting a cardigan for my daughter, all of the recommendations for I, where I think we're all for wool, but I think just uh, an acrylic is that feels like a wool is just a good replacement for that. But like I said, it's a swatching thing. You'll have to swatch and try, but acrylic definitely has its place. No acrylic snobs here. So those are the basic facts about acrylic anyway. So I'll have a link down below to an article that talks about this in more depth or it looks at different acrylic yarns. Of course, you can find them pretty much everywhere, but it's also blended with other fibers like wool. So it can be useful for lots of different things. But personally, I don't like it for garments for myself because I tend to run a little warm and I find that it's just not very breathable for me. I feel like it makes me feel clammy a lot. So for personally, for my own garments, I prefer to use natural fibers. In the summer, I really like cotton and linen and bamboo and all of those light plant fibers. And for my winter garments, it's usually wool or other animal fibers. But acrylic is a good choice in the right circumstances. And if you've got anything you'd like to add about using acrylic yarns, any more tips, especially advice about blocking and how you would treat different things like shawls, then I would love you to leave your comments and we can discuss that again next week. Now, before we get to what I've been knitting, I just wanna share about this week's sponsor, which is Knit Picks, and they still have those two sales going on. You can get 20% off on their fixed circular needles if you're looking to add a few to your set and also up to 30% off on their Knit Picks Aloft, which is a blend of Super Kid Mohair and Silk. So if you wanna try that holding two yarns together and getting that soft, fluffy halo, now is a good time to stock up on that yarn. So both of these will end this weekend, I believe. So now is a good time to go get a little bit of Knit Picks shopping done. I haven't been doing a ton of knitting this past week. I've just been busy with things for the website. I'm refining things for the knitting course and we were out with friends and church this weekend and just a lot of other things going on, dentist appointment, all of those things. So I didn't get as much knitting in as I would like, but I did get a bit in so we can see the progress I've made on different projects. First up is the sweater for my daughter. 
the sleeves, sleeve island this week, but I'm almost up to where I have to shape the sleeve cap. So that is the next thing. I'll probably tackle that this afternoon. And then I will get to the process of putting it all together and adding the shawl collar and the pockets. So we're closing in on the end for this cardigan. So this is done with Knit Picks Brava Sport Weight Yarn. It's their 100% acrylic machine, washable and dryable, fairly soft. And I think it's a good wool replacement. Even the ribbing looks nice, I think. I think it just looks really nice. Um, and I'm still deciding how I'm going to treat the pieces because you can see they sort of roll up on the sides and I've got to sew them all together. We had lots of recommendations and tips on how to treat that from leaving it as it is and just seaming them up this way, which I might do because I'm, I'm a bit lazy, um, or pin them out and spray them and let them dry and should work enough to get them so I can seam them up. And some recommendations for lightly steaming, but that one does make me nervous because I always heard that it would kill the acrylic yarn, like it's not going to move after you steam it. So I'm a bit nervous about that. But I've got plenty of yarn left and I think I'm going to do some experimenting because I'm really curious to know the best way to block it. Like, like we talked about that lace shawl example, how you would want to, I mean, if you've ever knit a lace shawl, you know it looks like a rumpled mess and you've got to pin it out and get it wet and let it dry so you can see, open up that lace and really see the design. But if you do that in acrylic, how does that work? So I'm, I wanna do some experiments with just some basic stockinette swatches just to see if there's a way to not kill it, but at least keep it from curling. I don't know. So we're going to experiment with that in the future, I think. But that is the progress for the sweater right now. I'm working on a new shawl design. Let me get that off. Um, huh, I'm not enjoying this process right now, but it's an asymmetrical triangle. I have done a top-down triangle. That pattern's coming out in June. Um, using the same yarn, it's Gage Dye Works Whiskey in a Teacup colorway. The top-down triangle shawl is on their merino cashmere nylon sock yarn this one's on their two ply fingering which is a super wash wool as well i believe um, same stitch patterns but this gray area is giving me trouble <laughs> i didn't really care for the same design as the top down triangle shawl so i went with just large eyelets but honestly i'm not loving that either so I sort of put it in timeout. I tried this last week after recording the podcast and then I haven't touched it since because it's just in timeout now while I think about what to do. Like the color is about maybe 60 grams of yarn and then the gray is like 100 grams of yarn. So it's going to be a big section and I just don't know what to do with it. So I might go back to doing like an eyelet ridge, just one row of eyelets and then something in there but it's got to be like my other thought was the it's got to be simple because because the way I'm writing this pattern is that like you could use any long color change yarn and your stitch count wouldn't matter as long as you had an odd number of stitches when you're working the right side or end with an odd number of stitches on the right side rows but then I thought about doing putting more space between the eyelets but then we run into that issue where I'm gonna to have to do like, you're gonna need a multiple of four. And I know that gets confusing for people. So I, I don't think that's gonna work either. So I'm gonna go sit with my stitch dictionaries and see if I can come up with something, something to do here. So I think we're back to doing an eyelet ridge right at the beginning, then that whole big gray section, and then finish with an eyelet ridge and a pico bind off but I don't know what to do in that whole big section of gray. The eyelets aren't gonna work. I just, I don't like them. Um, so some sort of a simple texture or just alternate stockinette and garter stitch. I don't know, maybe something like a fisherman's rib just for something different. I feel like that would be a little too much though. I don't know. <laughs> This one is still, yeah, it's it's in timeout until I figure out what to do. So does anybody else think about their knitting when they go to sleep and then sort of dream about it? I feel like I've been doing that with this shawl, like trying to dream up something that will work in this, this pattern. I don't know, but hopefully it will come to me in my sleep. My father-in-law's fingerless mitts are off the needles now. They are all finished. I think they 
meet his requirements for length and everything like that. I did a tubular edge along the top and the bottom. Now the bottom I started with a smaller needle size, the tubular edge, and then went to my normal needle size for everything. But I did not do that at the top. So it sort of buckles out a little bit on both of them. So that's the only thing, but I don't think that's gonna matter to him. I'm probably the only one that's gonna notice that. So I've thought about the different ways to make a convertible top for these. And I think because I'm using this tubular edge, I wanna continue that on the, the ribbing on the convertible flap part. So I think the best way to do that is to cast on and work the tubular edge and then pick up stitches along the back of the mitten and then join in the round and work the ribbing in the round and then do the top and then like a normal mitten top. But I think that might work best. My other thought was like start with a um, invisible cast on edge like Judy's Magic Cast On like you would for a toe up sock and then knit the mitten top that way and then finish with the tubular edge. But then I've got to join it to the back here and then I think a tubular edge sticking out where it's joined on the knitting would be kind of strange. So I think I am going to go with that method of starting with, because I want to do the, because I've done the tubular edge everywhere else, I just think it should, it would look nice to do the convertible top that way as well. So I think that's the way I'm going to work it. So I just have to get that all sorted out and I'll probably record it while I do it so you can see how it comes out. But they look nice, just that video to record next. Now I'm knitting these in Jameson and Smith, their two ply fingering weight jumper weight yarn. It's a really nice wooly, wooly yarn. Moss green is the color. And a few weeks ago, I mentioned that I had a lot of this yarn left, eight skeins of it, and probably at least half of each of the skeins still left. This was the yarn that I used for the hat for my level three of the Master Hand Knitting Program. Um, so I was trying to decide what to do with this, and I had picked out a mitten pattern that I really loved, but I realized I don't have enough of the main yarn for the mittens. I'd have to order two skeins of yarn to use up a little bit of yarn and I'd only use a little bit of what I have here. So I'm back to looking at different patterns and I looked at a whole bunch and couldn't find any mittens that I wanted to knit um, where I had enough yarn. A lot of them are just like two colors and you need a full skein of those two colors for a stranded color work mittens and I don't have a full skein. I've got like half a skein of most of these. So I decided I'm just going to knit wrist warmers to match the hat that I knit for the program. So I've just started that. I'm doing doing it on Magic Loop and it's, <laughs> it's just a little mess right now. Um, just getting started. The corrugated ribbing. So I'm going to have like a corrugated rib and then the pattern that was around the hat. And then there's a larger motif on the hat and then repeat the smaller pattern again and then finish with corrugated rib. So I figure these are probably gonna be like nine inches long. I think by the time they're done, but they'll match my hat. So I think that would be nice to have a matching hat. And I'm not gonna bother with thumbs because I don't wanna deal with thumbs and stranded color work. And that just seemed like too much hassle. Then I thought about just making like thumb holes, but that means you have to knit back and forth in rows. And I don't wanna do stranded color work in the wrong, on the wrong side rows. I like to do that in the round. And I think to do the thumb, like if I were going to, you would bind off and work back and forth or not bind off, you would just work back and forth for enough rows to make the thumb. And I don't wanna do, do that, I'm too lazy. So we're just gonna not even do any thumb holes or gussets or anything. So they'll just be wrist warmers that you can sort of pull up over your hand anyway. They just won't have any, any place for your thumb. So perhaps when it's all done, I might just release the pattern for the hat and the wrist warmers all together. It would just be one size for each of them because it's a, a 30 stitch repeat. So I don't know if you thought much about how that works in a design, but like 30 stitches, well, there's 60 stitches here. So I can't do another repeat of that pattern or you'd have like giant wrist warmers. <laughs> so it's, it's gonna be just one size because the, the repeat for the stitch patterns itself is so large. So same with the hat, like it will be one size for the hat because if you'd add another 30 stitches, it's going to be massively big for anybody. So it only works out. That's why you'll see sometimes like with stranded color work patterns that they only come in one size because, because the way the stitch pattern works out when you have a large stitch repeat, you can't get 
multiple sizes. Like if it were just a five stitch repeat, then yeah, if it's five stitches to the inch, then we could do like a one inch, you know, add an inch and then have a bunch of different hat sizes. But when you have a 30 stitch multiple, you can't do that. So it'll be one size. Oh, and you can see the motifs right here. So it would just be the small motif and then this larger motif and then repeat the smaller motif again. So, and then the corrugated rib at the top. So that's about the same number of stitches. It should fit just fine. I think it'd be really pretty as a wrist warmer, I think. And then it would have, this is my prototype hat. This isn't the one I sent in because I changed the crown, but this crown is still pretty, I think. But the, I have different motifs on the other one but the main motifs are the same. They're just not centered properly. I don't know, that was another thing I changed. I wanted them to line up. We've got like the brim here with these really pretty prominent spokes. But if you look right there, this doesn't line up with it. It's like off by one or two stitches. And I wanted that like to be centered with the motif. So I had to rework that too, because I didn't take that into account when I was working on my chart. So this hat didn't make the final cut, but I think matching wrist warmers and a hat, that would be a pretty pattern. A lot of ends to weave in though. <laughs> so that's what I've decided to do with all of this yarn that I had is to knit wrist warmers instead. And the way I'm going, I might even just have enough left for another hat, we will see. But when you have eight skeins of yarn for one project, it doesn't, it doesn't take much yarn for that project. But anyway, that is the plan for this leftover yarn is to knit some matching wrist warmers. And I think I might, yeah, I might have the pattern for sale afterwards with the hat and the wrist warmers together. And I'm not sure if I even said, but it is a Knit Picks palette. It's a, like a two ply fingering weight yarn, 100% wool. It's a really nice yarn, really good for color work knitting. And it has lots of lots of colors. Time to get a little bit nerdy and talk about some knitting books. And this week I wanted to talk about Japanese stitch dictionaries. I just say that slow because it's hard to get that word out, stitch dictionaries. And I've got four of them that I really like, all from Tuttle Publishing. Basic ones that have lots of different stitch patterns in them. Twisted stitches, cables, lace, um, open work. They all look like this. You'll see a big photograph of a swatch and then a chart. No written instructions in these books. This one's a little bit different. It has a lot of cables in it. The other one does as well, but I feel like this one has more cables. Oh, well, it has lace as well. So you've got these big swatches and then the charts. There's some of the cables. And I think most of them have Oh, this one has like a good section of ribbing, different ways to do ribbing as well. Oh, and this one had the round yolks. I really like these different um, ways to do yolks. You could make like just little lace collars like that or like for a sweater. And then there's this one. This one is specifically lace. Same idea, big picture. And then the swatch, the swatch of the, pic the picture of the swatch and then the chart as well. Now the charts are a little bit different. Um, think about the charts you're familiar with. You have the knit and the purl stitches and you've got those black dots to represent purl stitches on the right side of the work. You don't see those, well you do see those, but you don't see those in the Japanese charting. They like to be visually uncluttered. And so if the pattern is reverse stockinette and then you've got some sort of stitch on top of that, it's not going to be filled with little black dots to represent purl stitches like we would have in our patterns. Instead, there is a little symbol at the bottom or a little key that will tell you which, which uh, stitch is used in those blank boxes. So your background always looks like, like it's uh, knit stitches, but it might not be. That little key at the bottom will tell you if that background stitch is supposed to be knit or if it's supposed to be purl. That way they don't have to fill all those empty block boxes with little black dots to represent purl stitches. That's the first big difference. That can feel confusing, but you gotta wrap your brain around that. And if it's hard to tell, then look at the picture of the swatch and look at like the background 
of the stitch itself. And you can tell if it's reverse stockinette or if it's if it's um, stockinette. Now that I'm used to it, I prefer that that less cluttered look of the Japanese charts where they don't always have purl stitches represented even if it's like reverse stockinette fabric. You use that little symbol to decide what's this background stitch going to be. Are those blank boxes knits or purls? And I just, I really like that now that I'm used to it, but it takes a minute to get your head wrapped around that chart. They also are not as hand-holding as we are in like North American knitting patterns. They assume that you understand with a chart that if you're working flat, you're gonna work across the, the way that the stitches are, or the, the symbols, the way they're written. And then when you work on the wrong side row, you have to reverse that. Like, let's say um, the front of the fabric is stockinette, so you know when you're working a wrong side row, you have to purl. They assume that you know that. They're not gonna explain that in the chart. The third thing with the patterns and the charts from Japanese companies is that their symbols and notations are standardized. So all the Japanese charts and books and things that you'll find, they all use the same symbols. Like here, can be any symbols you want. I could make up my own symbols if I wanted to. There's nothing standardized about knitting, but it is in Japan. So any books that you find, all of the symbols are going to be the same no matter what book it is. Now I do have one book that has not been translated, so I do have to do some work to figure out what's going on there, but the other books I have are all translated into English. So all of those techniques that I'm not sure about, they're all completely explained very clearly in these books as well. So that's the basics of what you'll see with the knitting chart, but then there's also how Japanese patterns are written, and they're very different from North American and English patterns, where we have lots of writing and lots of words and lots of explanations. They assume if you're knitting, you know how to do things, and they don't put them all in the pattern to explain everything to you. For example, here's this hat right here. This would be the pattern. That is it, one page, most of it charted, and then they use a schematic to explain, like it tells you on the, the, this little schematic, you cast on this number of stitches, you work this on smaller needles for this many rows, then you use your chart and your stitch pattern for this many rows. That little schematic and that chart, that's your pattern, and then at the top, all that's listed there is your materials, your yarn, your supplies, your finished measurements, your gauge, and some a few little notes. But most of your pattern is right here. This schematic and this chart. So it takes some getting used to when you're used to having everything written out, lots of links and explanations and all of that. They are very written, very, written very, very briefly. It's very interesting. The book, I, I have another book that's in Japanese and once you understand, you don't even really have to refer to the directions, you just use the chart. And the chart is the same in any language because it's just symbols. So it, it takes a, a bit for your mind to get used to it. But I really like their way of charting. But if you prefer written instructions, you will not want uh, Japanese knitting patterns or stitch dictionaries because there are no written instructions. It's all charted out for you. But these are probably, after my Barbara Walker's, these are probably the stitch dictionaries I go to most often. Just, I really like, they're very creative and inventive and they just, I don't know, I really like their patterns. Like they're just very pretty. Even the ones on the cover, just really pretty patterns. So there are many of them and I'll link the four that I have down below. They're all from Tuttle Publishing, but I'm sure you can find other ones as well, but these, are my, I couldn't pick a favorite. I really like them all. They're all really nice to have. Um, I really like stitch dictionaries, but, and I really kind of do like the way they write their patterns. They're, it's very brief. And when I'm knitting, when I write out my own instructions, that's kind of sometimes what I do. I just have like a little picture and then a few little notes and I can knit from that. But it takes some experience to get used to that method. So it's a big difference knitting like North American patterns compared to Japanese patterns and what's expected of the designer and what's expected of the knitter. There is more expected of the knitter with Japanese patterns, I think, than there is with uh, North American English knitting patterns. Less is, ex I mean, you still have to know how to do the things, but 
there is more explanation and more detail and lots sometimes even links to tutorials and things like that so it depends on your skill and how adventurous you are and what you'd like to try but they are worth at least giving one a try I think if you find there's lots of Japanese knitting books as well that have lots of patterns, not necessarily just stitch dictionaries. So it's worth giving something like that a try just to see what, what it's like to knit from a pattern like that. So anyway, that's all for our discussion about stitch dictionaries this week. Goodness, try to say that five times fast. <laughs> But that is it for this episode as well. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been really fun hanging out with you today. And if you're new here and want to watch past episodes of this season, I'll put a playlist right here. You can catch up on all the things that we've been discussing and I'll see you in the next episode.